First off, thank you very much, everybody, for, for coming out. This is awesome. Um, I love this space. Restaurant, cafe here as well. It's very cool. I've uh, been having great uh, chats with people tonight, and it's, uh, it's really awesome just seeing the whole thing come about. Uh, when I came up about, um, uh, when I came in, none of this stuff was set up, and these guys have done a fantastic job in helping me set some stuff up here and, uh, and putting all this together. So, um, yeah, kudos to you guys. That's awesome. Um, thanks uh, to the organizers here as well, Big Muddy Speaker Series. Uh, thanks to Steve Schnarr, who is in Columbia right now, Columbia, Missouri, uh, for getting a hold of me and saying, hey, dude, you want to do this? And me saying, yeah, dude, I do. And uh, here I am. It's pretty awesome. I've got a little thing over my ear, over here, and a microphone that uh, I don't know if you can all see. It's one of those cool, like, TEDx kind of microphones. I feel so sophisticated right now. It's awesome. Um, I, I don't have to. It's, it's like, I just want to do, like, some Britney Spears moves or, or something here. But they told me not to wander too far from the patio, so I can't do, like, any... any well, I can't show off, actually, I guess. Um, but uh, I came here tonight to, to uh, talk about my books, talk about my publishing company, which is called Crow Books, which I founded a couple years ago so I could publish all my, all my books, and hopefully in the future publish some, uh, some books by other people as well. I was talking to a gentleman tonight, Mike, uh, who would like to uh, put out a book of his travels in Mexico that he did years ago. And he said one of the hardest things that he's done is to get to the stage where he's comfortable enough with his book to be able to publish it. So he's still in the, he's still in the draft stage, basically. Um, I'm well acquainted with the draft stage. I've been there many times myself. Uh, feels like I've written 10 books by now, but there's only two. But uh, I'm proud of those two for sure. We were talking about uh, the river, the river that runs right past Kansas City, the, the big Missouri, the big muddy. Uh, you're all well acquainted with it, and I'm sure some of you have been on it, uh, paddling as well. Uh, I was in Parkville last night talking to a group there, a group of city officials uh, and paddlers, and we were talking about possibly putting a paddler's camp, a place that long-distance paddlers could stop and overnight in, in Parkville. And I'd really like to see that happen. There's, there's a great spot there, uh, Platts Landing. Uh, there's a boat ramp, so it's easy to get the boat out if you're in a kayak or a canoe uh, or on stand-up paddleboard, if it, so be it. Um, and there's a toilet there, there's fresh water there, there's a road where they could walk into downtown if they wanted to get a burger or a beer or uh, resupply. And they're probably only gonna be there overnight and then get back on the river. From doing long distance travels on rivers, I know that research is really critical. People do a lot of research before they do a trip. And they have an agenda. Almost all of them have a place to go back to. They have loved ones and friends that they want to see. Uh, so they have an agenda. They have an itinerary as well. So um, knowing that 50 miles downstream, they can stop, resupply overnight, and then get back on the river the next morning and continue on, and not have to worry about stopping in, uh, in Kansas City, because it's, I gotta say, I mean, even though there are boat ramps in Kansas City and, and a number of parks, Riverfront Park, I think, uh, is one of them, um, I didn't, when I paddled through, I didn't stop. I stopped at Caw Point, I stayed with some people in Kansas City, uh, we went back in the morning, I put my boat back in and continued on. Um, and then paddled right through, down probably another 30 miles, and then camped somewhere in the forest, I think, after that. Uh, and I don't recall seeing anywhere along the Kansas City, uh, through the downtown area, anywhere, where I would want to leave a boat for any, any length of time, you know? 
so having something like that in, in Parkville would be awesome. Be able to leave your boat for an hour and go into town and get what you need and then come back. That would be great. So I'd really like to see that happen. Uh, and I think last night there was good discussion about it. And I think it's, it's on the positive side. I think they're going to make the right decision in, in Parkville. So um, in 2012, I paddled 3,800 miles from the utmost source of the Missouri River uh, in the Centennial Mountains of southern Montana, close to the town of West Yellowstone, actually, and uh, started at a place called Brower Spring. I guess it's not really a place, because there's, like, there's no place name there. It's just a little, a little area, about that big, where the uh, water bubbles out of the mountainside at 8,800 feet, 200 feet below the Continental Divide. When I was there, I climbed up and looked into Idaho. It was beautiful. So it was pretty cool to go all the way from the spine of the continent all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And along the way, I met some river angels. I met people long distance, people who help long distance paddlers. I didn't know it at the time, but there was a whole network of people along the river that enjoy uh, following along vicariously and also uh, offering help, offering assistance when paddlers come into their area. I was on Fort Peck Lake in, uh, in Montana, in eastern Montana, and I was in a dead zone for about 10 days. I had no internet uh, access, I had no cell phone access. Tom Bailey over here, he's smiling because he's been through it as well. Uh, Tom paddled from Three Forks uh, to the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. And I remember reading Tom's uh, blog that, that he put together as well, which uh, was part of my research. So uh, years later, I got to meet Tom, and Tom's uh, developing uh, into a fantastic guy. But he's, our friendship is developing, let's say that. So, um, and being on Fort Peck Lake is very isolating. At times, it seems like I'm on another planet. I was on another planet or, or like on the moon or something. Just so different from what was upstream and what was downstream. And I had no idea what was going on in the outside world, especially the Facebook world, because when I do stuff like this, I like to share my adventures. And I'd been very adamant about keeping everything up to that point. Well, a friend of mine got a hold of me and said, the only way that we knew that you were alive was that your GPS tracker was still blinking. It was still showing that you were moving forward. My spot tracker, as, as it's called. Um, so it, the spot tracker was an entertainment device for those people back home, because then they knew that I was alive. Um, I couldn't look at it, I couldn't look at the page, but they could look at the page and find out where on the river I was at any time. It put out a waypoint every 10 minutes. So when I finally got down to Fort Peck Lake, uh, to the dam at Fort Peck Lake, uh, I had a, a Wi-Fi connection for the first time in 10 days, and I was like, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of likes, a lot of little red numbers up in the corner there. Things that we like to see make us feel important. And uh, sure enough, there was. And as I scrolled through my news feed, there were people in boats, in, in canoes and kayaks and stand-up paddle boards. I had no idea who they were. And I kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And then I scrolled some more and scrolling and scrolling. And still, I didn't know any of these people. But I'm thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. How did they end up on my news feed? My sister had been monitoring my Facebook page. And people had been requesting, uh, a friend, sending friend requests to her. It turns out that my friend, who, my who, friend-to-be, Norm Miller, had approached my sister and said, we know what Rod's doing. We would like him to join our Facebook group page called Missouri River Paddlers. And she said, sure, where do I do that? So she signed me up. Here's a bunch of photos that he sent me. 
post those on there. So Norm got right on and posted all this stuff. And all of a sudden, all these people knew that I was coming downstream. So as I'm scrolling through these things, I look and I go, wow, look at all the messages. Messages from uh, Waverly, Missouri. Messages from Columbia. Messages from Kansas City. When you get to our area, you can stay at our place. We'll host you. We'll get you a meal. We'll bring a cold beer to the boat ramp. We'll give you a pat on the back. We're here for you. These people, as I found out, were river angels. They were people who wanted to help out. They're long distance paddlers, some of them themselves. So it was, it was quite astonishing that now there was so many more people interested in my trip. And being a writer, each one of these people had a cool story to tell as well. And what they told me were about the obstacles that they had overcome during their journeys as well. And some of them were amazing. Uh, all of them, I should say, were amazing. So I went back a year later after I finished my expedition, after I got to the Gulf of Mexico and swam in the salty water and uh, did my little dance, just like this but maybe a little more movement, but I can't move too much because I've got this thing on my ear and this cord hanging by my butt. But anyways, um, <laughs> I uh, went back in December of 2014 and interviewed all of these people that helped me out. I did 22 interviews in 15 days. It was exhausting, but it was lots of fun. And I had tons of material. So I started putting that material into a series of books about river angels and about my travels and weaving all of those stories together. So this is the first of what will be four books, actually, of, uh, of river journeys and stories from, from people who, uh, who have overcome amazing, amazing things, uh, the, the most difficult things, heartbreaking things. Cancer, a woman, a friend of mine in Jacksville, Jackson, Jackson Mississippi, uh, breast cancer, diagnosed uh, at age 33. She's a mother with three uh, young girls. The doctor said, you'll never paddle again because you won't be able to hold the paddle over your head. Months later, she was competing in a race, uh, Battle of the Bayou in, in southern Mississippi. She won the race. Her kids competed in the, in the kids' version. They won the race. She said, I'm going to create my own race in Jackson. So she did. She won the race. <laughs> now she doesn't compete. She just organizes. But her kids do the, the, she also organizes a kid version of it too, which is pretty cool. It's called the Gator Bait Race, and, uh, which is <laughs> perfect for that area. They do have alligators where, uh, where, where they do the race. And uh, pretty awesome. So. I love telling her story, and I look forward to weaving her story in, into mine and the numerous other stories, too. Um, paddlers are really amazing people. They're tenacious, they're persistent, um, they're, they're egocentric at times, which I can totally relate to. They like to be the center of attention sometimes, but sometimes they're really humble, too. So um, they're friends. I call them friends. And River Angels takes on a lot of different definitions as well. So the people who are helping put something together in Parkville, those people are River Angels. People who are here uh, because they're concerned about the river and the health of the river, those people, to me, are River Angels. The people who helped out uh, the paddlers during the MR340, those are River Angels. And we have some of those in the, in the audience tonight. So, um, and the people who paddled the MR340, for that matter, are river angels because they're all ambassadors too, who go out and talk about how cool, how cool it was to paddle at night on the Missouri River and how safe they felt if they weren't hallucinating. Um, and, uh, and how that, for many of them, that was the most, the best part of the, uh, of the race for them. So. Um, Meeting these people have, has enhanced my life. 
It's given me tons of uh, material to talk about and to write about, and I'm forever grateful for that, definitely. So, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to read a couple excerpts from these books, uh, River Angels, which is my second book, and also Part-Time Superheroes, Full-Time Friends, uh, which is my first book, and a little bit about this book. In 2001, I went down the Mississippi River from source to sea with an old friend of mine. His name is Scott McFarlane. And I kind of wish that Scott was here tonight because he would be sitting in the front row heckling me because he's really good at that and he really enjoys that. And he would stand up and say, well, you know, that story that Rod just told or that excerpt that, from the book that Rod just read, it was sort of like that, but not really. And I've got a different version and I'm going to tell it to you right now. And I know that because I've invited Scott to a few of these events, and he loves to get up and be center stage. And I love to just let him get up and be center stage. He's just, he's the guy that when I said, hey, if anybody ever makes a movie about this book, who do you want to play you? I'm thinking like Brad Pitt, right? Like Brad Pitt, man, because you're a handsome guy, Scott, you know? And Brad Pitt is a handsome guy. He'd make a great fit, you know? And he said, the only person that can play me is me. And that's, that is Scott. So there's enough of Scott in this book, and there's enough of Scott in my life to fill several volumes for sure. But uh, so much so, and I love the guy. Love him like a brother. So much so that I decided to write a book about our friendship a real tribute to our friendship, and create two superhero characters as well to really mock our egos, because our egos definitely needed mocking, and, uh, and talk about our journeys going down the, uh, the, Missouri, or the Mississippi River from source to sea, and then in the same summer, ending up at the Burning Man Festival in Nevada. So we went right from, right from the Gulf right over to, uh, to an arts festival in the, in the desert, wearing the same handmade loincloth and sandals and the cut-off uh, coveralls that I bought for $10 in uh, New Westminster, BC, and uh, put a little name patch on it which said Jim, which was my superhero character. It was also our characters that we, that we played, I guess you could say, we played, at uh, Burning Man, so lots of fun. And we did that on the river. We rehearsed a lot on the river for what we were gonna do at Burning Man. So it was a, it was a hoot. It was a hoot of a summer, for sure. So um, what I did with this book is I leapfrogged the chapters. I talked about Scott and I in uh, first person. And then for the superhero characters, I did it all in narration. So basically, I stepped back and talked about these two superhero characters named Action Man and Jim. I'm the skinny one. Scott is the buff one. I'm the sidekick. Always the sidekick with Scott, for sure. So, so I'm, I'm the, bat, I'm the, I'm the uh, Robin to his Batman. I'm the cheetah, I guess, to his uh, Tarzan. So um, lots of good stuff in this book. Lots of funny stories and lots of stuff that Scott would heckle me about endlessly if he was sitting in the front row. I would, I, again, I would really like to bring him along on a book tour like this because it's just, the, the chemistry between us is so funny and the audience seems to just love it. So let's watch these two guys rip each other apart. This is awesome. So um, I'm gonna read a little bit from this book. This is a short excerpt. So we were in a canoe. It was a $250 canoe that we bought off an outfitter in uh, close to Lake Itasca, which is the source of the uh, Mississippi River in northern Minnesota. We bought it for $250, and the next day we sold it. We hadn't even used it yet. We sold it to the outfitter's brother who lived in, uh, in St. Paul. He said, when you guys are finished with it, if it's in good shape, I'll buy it from you. Awesome, 
So that whole part of the trip wasn't gonna cost us a dime. We just had to get this aluminum canoe to uh, 500 miles downstream in good shape and sell it to the guy. We eventually did that, which is pretty cool. So I would always try to get Scott's goat because we had this lovely chemistry together. And I didn't really like paddling a canoe all that much. It wasn't really my idea to, to use a canoe. It was actually my idea to take like a, a cheap inflatable, $100 inflatable boat, or maybe a Zodiac. A Zodiac would be cool. Let's take a Zodiac, Scott. I like saying Zodiac. Zodiac. We take Zodiac. Let's use a Zodiac, Scott. And uh, let's get a motor for it. And let's put lots of gas on it. And let's carry it around 15 dams above the Twin Cities. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Scott said, no, let's just get a canoe for 250 bucks. So I didn't get my Zodiac. And I had to sit in a canoe and do this for 500 miles. Instead of doing this, which I wanted to write in my journal. Scott, how about you sit behind me and do this for 500 miles? And I'll do this, and I'll write an awesome book. It'll be great. And he said, ha, that's not going to happen. You're going to be doing this. We're both going to be doing this. And so that's what we did. So I wasn't the happiest person on my self-propelled uh, journey that I really didn't want. And I didn't get my Zodiac. I didn't get to say Zodiac every day. So I would blow up from time to time. And this excerpt is the morning after a blow up. Scott, who I thought was making my trip worse, was actually the glue that was holding it together. He's the guy who didn't say anything when Rod was, little Rodney was whining, picking broken beer bottles out of the sand before he set up his tent. Hoo, hoo, hoo. He just sat over there and was quiet, just like the river. Many years later, I realized that he was the rock on that trip. And I was the one who was spinning out of control. So, and I thanked him for that when I wrote this book. With my volatility well slept off, we launched the canoe into yet another overheated morning. The city of St. Cloud was a short five mile paddle downstream and we resolved to find some cooling refreshments there. Still a bit numb from the night before, but comfortable in the bow, away from the face of Scott. The sudden sound of whitewater caught me completely off guard as we rounded a bend. Rapids! I yelled in near panic. I turned to see Scott's very serious face looking back at me. Run it, he yelled. Standing waves gnashed at our thrashing paddles and as the aluminum hull bonked off unseen boulders. Hard left, Roddy, shouted Scott. Hard! We plunged into a giant white wave, splitting it in two and drenching ourselves in the process. As the muddy water drained from my face, I forced my eyes open and saw a huge boulder directly in our path. I braced my legs for impact and felt Scott lean and dig in with his paddle. The canoe glanced off the boulder and fed, fell headlong into a menacing pit of madly circulating water. Hard right, yelled Scott from the rear. Dig! A fear that nearly froze me immobile. Overcoming a fear that nearly froze me immobile, I thrust, thrust the paddle deep into the frothy hole and watched the canoe shoot crazily sideways and bounce into a calm eddy near the shore. What was that? shouted Scott. Souk Rapids. I replied, turning back to look at him. The map said, scout before proceeding. We laughed hard and high-fived each other with our, with our paddles. Forget the cold drinks, Roddy, said Scott with a chuckle. I need to change my underwear. So Scott, went on, Scott and I went on to have some fun uh, adventures and other adventures as well. Road trips across uh, the US and road trips across Canada. We lived in Vancouver, British Columbia for 20 years. And as luck would have it, we settled in our own old hometown 
of Chatham, Ontario, Canada, um, where I lived for the first 20 years of my life and where he lived for the first 20 years of his life. He met a lovely woman named Midori. They have two children, and they live in Chatham. He has a much different life now than he did in 2001. But he cherishes his memories of the river and of Burning Man as well. So the book looks at our friendship and brings it all up to date at the end. He gets married, I buy a kayak. Hence this book. This one segues right into this one. And I start meeting people that I, five years ago, never would have thought that I would meet paddlers. I was a cyclist. I enjoyed riding across continents on my bicycle. In 2005, I, I rode from Vancouver, British Columbia, to Alaska, all the way to the Arctic Ocean, and went for a swim in the Arctic Ocean. And it was very cold, I might add. Uh, but I've also ridden a bicycle across Australia, from the most westerly point to the most easterly point, 5,100 miles, and across North America, from Vancouver to the far side of Newfoundland, uh, 5,200 miles altogether. And those experiences really bolstered my self-esteem, which was lacking as a kid. So. Meeting people who I could relate to on a bike was difficult. But when I got on a river, I started to meet people all the time. I never would have thought that, thanks to my sister and all those friend requests on, on uh, Fort Peck Lake in 2012. So 2012 was a very busy year for me and for my adventuring friends. I was invited to take part in a, uh, an eight-day, 105-mile descent of the Wolf River in northern Mississippi and Tennessee. Uh, the Wolf River, if you've ever been to Memphis, the Wolf River empties into the Mississippi River at Mud Island, at the foot of, uh, close to Beale Street, the foot of Beale Street. So um, my friend Dale Sanders, who is 81 this year. He's the oldest person this year to compete in the MR340 and finish it. He walked away with a medal. He was on a stand-up paddleboard with uh, his friend Jericho Lafort and Shane Perrin on a hand-built 18-foot stand-up paddleboard. That was like, I don't know how wide it was, 52 inches wide or something. It was quite a mammoth. It was a Stand-up paddle barge, I think, was the, uh, is what they called it. And uh, it was pretty awesome. And he paddled all 340 miles at 81 years old. And that would seem like a huge thing. And it was a huge thing, except that the year before, he paddled the entire length of the Mississippi River at 80 years old in a canoe, in a solo canoe as well all the way from Lake Itasca to the Gulf of Mexico. And he did it in 80 days. And not only that, he met every itinerary stop for media because he was raising money for juvenile diabetes. And he raised over $23,000. Did a lot of media interviews along the way and said, I'll be at this boat ramp, at this port, at this time. And he met every single one. And I love that. I love that part of the journey because I know how difficult it is to do that. Not always show up or show up and the media is not there and they never show up. Well, sometimes they show up. So it's pretty cool that he was able to do that and pull it all off. I was at the Gulf to take pictures of him when he finished on what's called the last beach, which is capitalized, uh, below Venice, Louisiana. It was pretty cool to be there with almost 30 other people on three boats, three motorized boats. Three, one of them was a shrimp boat as well, which was pretty cool. Uh, first time on a shrimp boat for me. And to be there as when my friend finished his journey. You'll see some business cards that I have here. And the one, the thin card, has a, uh, a photo of me that was taken by Dale on the last beach 
He was there when I finished my journey in, in early 2013. So Dale asked me to join him for this eight-day expedition. I said yes. A friend of mine, Dave Cornthwaite, who is quite an adventurer himself, he's from England. He has a project called Expedition 1000, 25 journeys, self-propelled journeys, using non-motorized uh, methods of transportation, and each one is more than 1,000 miles in length. Dave has skateboarded across the Australian continent. First time anybody ever did that. He stand up paddleboarded the, the, the entire length of the Mississippi River from source to sea in 2011. He's also swam 1,000 miles of the lower Missouri River, somebody that no, something that nobody has done before. And coming through this area, through Kansas City, yeah, it smells a little bit. Smells more when you're getting it right in, right, in, <laughs> right in your eyes and right in your mouth and right in your nose. It was quite a journey for him. And I love to tell the story of when he was swimming and dealing with an upset stomach and he would vomit and then swim through his vomit. That just really encapsulates the whole journey for him. Swimming through your own vomit and finishing. There's the race right there. So I was there at the, at the, uh, at the arch when he finished his 1,000 mile swim after he lost 30 pounds or whatever it was on his thin frame anyways. And gave him a big hug and said congratulations. Earlier that year, he was in Memphis. Earlier, just before that, he said, hey, I've been given a four-wheeled bicycle. Looks like a car without a car body. It's got two drivetrains and two seats and a steering mechanism of, of sorts. Can you help me get it from Eugene, Oregon to Memphis, Tennessee? Because I want to ride it 1,000 miles from Memphis to Miami. And I said, that's the craziest idea I ever heard. Sure, I can do that. So it was my job to get it across the country. All of that and how I did that, which ended up being far more difficult than I ever imagined, is in this book. And Dave, who likes to say yes, he's a yes man. He started a project called Say Yes More. He also said yes to Dale Sanders' request to join in on the Wolf River descent eight days, which sounded easy to both of us. And we had communication, I had communication with Dave, and it was like, dude, all we need to do is like show up. We're gonna have topo maps, we're gonna have GPS. These guys got all the coordinates. It'd be easy, man. Eight days, not gonna take us eight days to paddle 105 miles, that's crazy. What we didn't know was that we would be going through snake-infested swamps for the first three days. We would also be on stand-up paddle boards which some, for some reason, I said, yes, yeah, so I'll do that, even though I've never been on a stand-up paddle board. I'll paddle a stand-up paddle board. So they got the stand-up paddle boards. We showed up. So did the snakes. And we ended up not paddling those paddle boards too much because we were pulling them through the swamp for the first three days. So what I'm going to do, oh, look at that. I forgot that we put that up there. I'm going to show some footage. This footage here was taken uh, on day three. This is a film that was put together by a friend of mine, a filmmaker in Memphis. His name is Chris Rays. You'll see uh, L, let me get this right, LFM, live from Memphis. He used to run a, an entertainment guide in Memphis in 2012. It's now defunct, unfortunately, but uh, he's moved on to other projects. He does a lot of work with the city there, which is pretty cool. And he put together this cool little GoPro uh, video. He was in this 18-foot monstrous canoe with his friend Philip Be Beasley behind him, another musician. And uh, these guys were paddling this big boat through. He had the 
uh, the, the GoPro mounted on the front, and he had like this $20,000 camera that he was taking all of this am amazing footage with. And unfortunately, I don't have that footage here tonight, but it's a 40 minute edit, so I didn't want to show that anyways. But it's very cool. But we get to see this. He put together this little uh, tribute to day three of the eight days. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at this. <laughs>
These guys had a tough day three because they were drinking all night. Uh, Chris, Chris came out in a, that was Chris there with the cool hat. Uh, Chris Rays came out, uh, Philip Beasley, uh, John Henry. They, they came out in a four by four to meet us at what's called uh, pipeline number five. I think there's probably five people that that means anything too, but that's where we camped at pipeline number five. Um, and <laughs> they brought lots of beer with them and like an amazing assortment of food, which they then proceeded to cook over the fire. It was, it was incredible. So in the morning, the guy came back with a four by four, took all of our gear, all of our camping equipment, but not the beer, and uh, left the beer and went away. And basically, we were left without any gear. And the, the object there was to paddle downstream to where the gear was, which was all in John Henry's truck at the end of, at a bridge, actually, the first major bridge on the river, which is called the uh, New 72 Bridge. And that would mean the same to the same five people. Um, but that was our goal for the day. And it wasn't far. Like, we probably only had to paddle maybe 12 miles or something like that. But we got a late start. Dale, the ever diligent uh, Navy man, wanted to start at 7.30 in the morning. Oh, Brenda laughed. That's funny. She knows Dale. Um, she crewed for Dale on the, uh, on the Missouri, on the MR340. Dale is an interesting guy, for sure. And he just loves to get up and go. But that day, he didn't go anywhere because we didn't get on the river till 11 a.m. So Dale just stewed for a few hours, and I had to hear about it. We finally got on the river. We went through a whole bunch of crazy stuff. There's stuff right at the end. When you see, when you see uh, Chris at the end, it's just like, oh, and his expletive there that uh, he slowed down. That was getting into the tough part of the day, and the tough part was still to come. There was three quarters of a mile at the end of that day that was just brutal. Unmaintained debris that had just piled up for years, and it was John Henry's idea to take us all through it, to finish strong. Let's finish strong today. Let's drink lots of beer and finish strong. A Zodiac might have been a good thing to have there. The comic relief of me saying Zodiac. There was no comic relief on this day. It was a very difficult day, and it was only day three. We still had five more days of this stuff to do, and it didn't get a lot easier. All of those eight days get examined in this book. Supas, S-U-P-A-S. Day three, April 9th, 2012, and it was Easter Monday. John Henry withdrew his wooden canoe paddle from the river and laid it dripping atop one of the craft's thwarts. He heaved a heavy sigh, braced his boots against the bottom of the hull, and stood straight up in one sinuous motion. Suddenly, he was the tallest thing in the swamp. He lifted both hands to his brow and shielded his eyes from the glaring sun as he scanned the slough for a navigable channel. I'm looking for moving water. He'd say, earlier in the day, while perched in the same statuesque stance, I'm looking for moving water. Somehow he'd found it then, and I had no doubt that he would find it now. John's good at locating the current, I thought, but he's not too good at keeping it. I looked over at Dale. His canoe was empty except for an expensive camera, a snack bag, and a jug of water. His camping gear, like mine, was locked in the bed of John Henry's truck, five miles downstream at the Highway 72 bridge. If we didn't reach the bridge by sundown, we'd be sleeping in our boats in the middle of a snake-infested swamp. Dale wasn't scouting and standing. He was twitching in his seat like an impatient toddler in a shopping cart. He wiggled and wriggled and jiggled and squirmed. 
He fretted and fussed and tossed and turned. And I thought he would leap clean free of the boat and dance across the lily pads like a gravityless goat. But stay in his seat, he did against choice and pursed his lips purple and silenced his voice. His anger was evident, his confidence irked, and beneath his white hair, insanity lurked. I hoped not to see it, hoped not he'd show how volatile and malicious or low he could go. He'd voiced it before in spurts on day two when John Henry was absent from this hullabaloo. But now John was near, within eyeshot, within ear, within uncomfortable range that filled Dale with a fear so irrational, so silly, so crazy, so true, that it spread wide across his face like a cancerous hue. A blackened shade, a darkness made from antiquated thoughts and redundant beliefs that festered in a mind saturated with grief. Tis in my nature to counsel, to guide, Tis in my nature to cower, to hide. Tis in my nature to love, to support. Tis in my nature to abandon, to abort. Tis in my nature to leave the wolf pack, to stumble ever onward and never look back. But look back I do, and sometimes I stare long and wish for forgiveness, for loving, for friends stayed in strong, who voiced their displeasure with respect and esteem, who cast off their burdens and admit they were wrong. Surely, thinks I, there can be such apt closure, such wounds healed from truth and truthful exposure, a venomous behavior that no longer favors the goodness of all those who partake in the complicated crossing of a shallow, dank lake that lies in a remote corner of an American state, in the middle of nowhere, nowhere exists. And with nowhere comes questions and wringing of wrists. And when wrists have been wrung and skin slothed away, marrow and marrow will cease to decay. A new hope will spring from a font once kept shrouded, and a new path will arise, uncluttered, uncrowded. Surely, thinks I, the canoe statue man with the ginger goatee who stands here before us like a young cypress tree will find moving water and set us all free. This way, shouted John Henry, pointing off to his right. His gaze led to a tangled row of cypress trees that towered over the swamp. Follow me. Dale looked unsure. Doubt furrowed his forehead and crinkled the dangling gray mustaches that doubled as eyebrows on his 76-year-old face. It was a face that had weathered more storms than the rest of our group had seen collectively. Based simply, simply on longevity, Dale trumped us all when it came to experiences in life and on water. He was a river guide, used to leading groups on the wolf, but now he was being led, something he secretly hated. His anger had been brewing all day, all week, all month. In the split second before John perched himself back on his canoe and set and began paddling toward the, cypress, the towering cypresses, I carefully watched Dale's wrinkled face for a telltale reaction. There it was. The head shake of disagreement, followed quickly by the scowl of impatience and the glare of resentment. He was a silent, seething mess. He was relinquishing power. He was following the leader. He was also following the only person among us who had paddled this section of the wolf. John guided us down a twisting corridor of cypress trees, their gray-brown trunks rooted well below the waterline. The river's rippled surface parted cleanly around each tree as the channel flowed under our boats. Fallen trees blocked the route on numerous occasions, and we found ourselves atop them, hauling our paddle boards and canoes over the trees and back into the stream. It was tedious work. Finally, 
we reached what appeared to be an impasse. The forest had pinched us tightly into a corner. John left his craft and scouted the area ahead for an opening, and he returned several minutes later with the news. It's a dead end. No way through, he said as he climbed in his canoe. We have to go back. So what I'm going to show now is a film that was put together in like three hours. I don't know how he did it. Um, he's good at that. He's, it's Dave Cornthwaite's film. That guy right there, that ginger. He's from England. Likes to interrupt me sometimes. And uh, he was there. He showed up on day four. Actually, at the end of day three. He was, he was stuck. I was gonna, I, this will be fun to tell. He was stuck in an air-conditioned airport in Hawaii because he had just sailed a thousand miles, actually it was a little more than a thousand miles, he had sailed on like a 70-foot yacht from Mexico to Hawaii as part of his big project. I think he had it kind of cush for a few, a few weeks on, on the boat, although they put him to work for sure. But he wanted to be there with us, right from the source of the wolf all the way to its mouth but he missed the first three days. So he showed up right at the end. It's still daylight in this video. We didn't get there until after dark. The end of the video before, we were on our way to here. So those three quarters of a mile that were really, really tough are just out of sight. In the shadows, see those trees back in there? That's where all the fun is. Dave was out here looking like he just stepped off well, I don't know. He hadn't shaved in a while. But he had it easy for a few weeks, to tell you that. But as you'll see, he had his challenges as well. He put this together. It's, about, it's, it's a 12-minute edit. He put it together in, uh, in three, three hours. Turned out really good. He's made over 10, no, wait a minute, 200 short films. He's doing great. Uh, Stand-up guy, hard worker. He's an adventurer. He's an author speaker, and he's doing some amazing work, bringing positivity and adventure into the lives of a lot of people. So kudos to him. Let's roll this. It's April 9th, 2012, and it's time for another adventure. Usually when I start paddling along a river, it's from the very source. But this time, unfortunately, that is not the case. Last week, I finished sailing across the Pacific with the crew of Sea Dragon. And now, I'm very close to Memphis in Tennessee. And I'm about to put in underneath the beautiful Highway 72. For three days, I tried in vain to fly out of Honolulu. And in the meantime, a trusty group of friends had already begun their descent of the Wolf River from Baker's Pond, Mississippi. First time on a stand-up paddleboard here, Baker's Pond. Wish us luck, because we're going to need it. As I reclined in an airport seat several thousand miles away, Jonathan Brown, Dale Sanders, and Rod Wellington, along with a few other section paddlers, were dragging their stand-up paddleboards and canoes through thick, muddy swamp. Their short communications out of the bush had suggested it would be both their first and last time through that terrain. Are you here yet? For all the warnings about hot days, cold nights, mosquitoes, fallen trees, cypress knees, and poisonous snakes, I was sad to have missed the challenges of the upper 18 miles. As I trudged the highway bridge, waiting impatiently for our gallant paddlers to transpire from the undergrowth, a squished blue runner brought me back to reality. Just as this venomous snake had tragically failed to negotiate a man-made route, I was about to join a journey through a habitat not designed for humans. With log after log, dragging out through mud, it was a really a difficult I paddled on the head because I fell in, got wet, and I started getting chills, so I had to move. <laughs> oh, this is my aqua pack bag. Well, now, the thing is, I paddled from, from there to LaGrange. 
Here we go. Give us a wave, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Rod. <laughs> Pulling our paddle boards up over logs and wading through swamps. Pretty cool. Let me go back around here and maybe jump on that line there. And you can see that as you're looking at my iPad inside this beautiful Aquapack dry bag. The king of subtle advertising, Jonathan Brown there, everybody. Great, You're looking comfortable all sat down there. Oh yeah, get back. I wish you No, it's been good today. I've enjoyed it. It was fun. It was long. And I am tired. You're sleepy, dude. I am tired. But well deserved. JB put all this together. It was his idea in the first place. So this man's oh. amazing. This man is incredible. Uh, how old are you now? 105? Uh, getting close to it. <laughs> My birthday, I'll be 78. 78. And when's your birthday? You know what? I forgot. Uh, those of you who watched the Mississippi videos from last year's expedition um, will remember that Dale isn't retired, he's retarded. <laughs> you for a living, Dale? Nothing. Nothing. I'm retarded. I'm retarded. I'm retarded. I'm retarded. <laughs> and he's been playing around with cotton mouse today. Snakes. Poisonous snakes on his paddle. Very naughty. Jonathan, what do you think? Am I bringing it over? Put it on your board? You better not put this thing on board. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'm the one guy that hadn't fallen in, so you threw a snake on my board. So Rod's from Canada, uh, adventurer extraordinaire. How are you feeling, buddy? You've done all four days so far. A little sleepy? Yes, I'm tired today and uh, a little grumpy. I've been grumpy every day, actually, and uh, everybody here has been basically tolerating my grumpy mood for the last four days. And um, he's laughing, but I'm not. <laughs> it's challenging. We've had our fair share of challenges again today, but um, we're pushing through it and we found this beautiful little sandbar here to camp on tonight. So, um, yeah. Look at Dale, he's unstoppable. Thanks, buddy. Hey, it's been hard today, but I think the challenge has been worth all of the beauty that we've experienced. And this sandbar that we found is uh, probably the biggest and one of the only sandbars we've seen all day. So we've been pretty lucky. The end of another day on another river. The fire's burning. I think I. Am I looking after this? Oh. <laughs> no. Look at this. Beautiful. Okay. Time for food. It's hard to beat the feeling of waking up on a sandbar early morning, however cold it is, and getting out on the water, especially on a stand up paddleboard. It's day two on the wolf. These are the kind of conditions we've had to encounter time and time again. Although, <laughs> although this is probably the easiest portage of the entire lot so far. Just a simple tree trunk. JB is a dab hand at this, as you can see, with his little vibram five finger feet, making him look like something out of Avatar. How are you doing over there, buddy? When a camera is pointed at JB, he's incapable of acting like a normal human being. <laughs> the 
mayor of LaGrange has come out to see us. My old friend Tom is here. My brother and I stayed with Tom last year. Hey, buddy. Hello, hello. Now, the funny thing is, Tom's brought his canoe. Look how clean it is compared to the rest of us. That's a perfectly clean canoe. Oh, Look at the behind me. Look at that. Oh, by the way, we've travelled further in the first hour and a half today than we did in the entire morning yesterday. Let's we'll see about harvesting this hollow log. <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah, and you didn't you may have noticed the water running off up through there. And it runs off into this section we call the famed ghost section of the Wolf River. Inadvertently I free my mind's eye to see inside your tragedy. Still I need your sweet release. Inundate me, steal my every fantasy. Quite a fast flowing technical section here, dodging all of these trees and stuff. My paddleboard has become wedged under an enormous fallen log. JB's rope is stuck. <laughs> he just came around this corner and uh, that's wrapped around another log. So we're in a slight predicament. Luckily, we're first in the line of paddlers today. If we don't get through this, we're going to cause a log jam. Tell me what's your favorite song so that we can sing along. Tell me what's your favorite thing to do. Is it staying up till dawn? Is it dancing all night long? Tell me, honey, we will learn to dance with you.
<laughs> yes. Very good. That's going to be cool right there. There's Dave Cornthwaite's uh, website if you want to check it out. There's lots of cool stuff there and uh, more of his films and links to, to his films as well. Um, please, if you get a chance, if you only watch one other Dave Cornthwaite film or a, a film about Dave Cornthwaite, make it uh, Swim 1000, the journey that he did, uh, the, the swim that he did on the Missouri River here. It's a, an awesome uh, eight-minute film done by his friend from Florida, Miguel. Endura, um, a great filmmaker. He's doing some pretty cool stuff for sure. And he, he does some amazing art, uh, in, including a piece, including a piece uh, that was sold to J.J. Uh, Abrams. Uh, pretty awesome. And the little film that he made for that piece of art has been viewed over eight million times on, uh, on Vimeo. Um, so some pretty, amazing people involved in this project and the project in 2012. So uh, a lot of that stuff gets discussed in, in River Angels. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. We'll, I'll take some questions. Uh, ask me about expeditions if you want, or self-publishing uh, self questions if you're interested in that. And We'll do that. Any questions? <laughs>